Have you ever wondered what a psychologist might say to you about burnout? Especially as a young working professional? Well, here's your chance to listen in on a therapy session with the Space Between Us clinical psychologist, Luanele Kasu, and Asibe. Asibe is a 20-something credit risk analyst at a financial institution who is experiencing burnout. In her session with Luanele, you'll find out how you can feel like you are enough, how to establish boundaries in the workplace, protect your own space, and so much more. I'm Dori van Lachenberg, a TSBU contributor, and this is the very first episode in the Podcast for Courageous Young Professionals series. Proudly brought to you by Africa's online mental health platform, The Space Between Us. Hi, Asive. How are you doing? Hi, Loinele. I am, I don't know, I feel a little bit better post our first discussion, the discussion that we had before. I think I took a lot of notes in terms of handling some of the, you know, the very small changes that you can make in order to curb burnout a bit. But, you know, I still do feel burnt out and most of the time tired really yeah yeah so i think the last conversation we had um you were experiencing you know different things like just a little bit of numbness tingling just feeling overwhelmed and a lot of anxiety how are you finding yourself now and you're saying you're feeling a little bit better so which aspects of what you'd felt do you feel like kind of changed um, I actually did mention in our last discussion about the fact that I do journal already. And I remember you had made that example of when, you know, you're going to shop for stuff, you call out the list in your head and how that makes such a huge difference in terms of opening up capacity in your mind for other things so that you're less stressed out so that there's less that's there in your brain to keep there so I've tried to implement a strategy that is along those lines where I'm able to not think or have so many things in suspense in my mind so that I actually do have time for creative thinking and all the other stuff. So I just try to keep lists on paper or feelings that I may be feeling that I feel I can't necessarily resolve by just thinking about them and just try and write those down. In terms of my panic attacks, they definitely have gone down a bit. However, in recent weeks, um, my manager kind of got promoted and I was the only one in my team, which meant that I'm the one who has to carry most of the stuff, you know, within the team and everything, which has been a lot. Um, I'm not going to lie. And I think you you kind of get into that trap of constantly working because you feel like you're constantly trying to keep up with yourself or keep up with not feeling like you're failing others mm. or yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's such a, a hard thing because there's a level there of just trying to prove yourself, but also at the same time, wanting to be a functional human. That's not overwhelming themselves and, and, and overstressing. But I think you're saying something so important that most of the emotions kind of really come from a space of, am I doing enough? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? And I, f- I generally find that quite a lot of burnout have I actually reached my level or my standards of my achievement and can I still do more? Definitely. I think um, especially when you're in corporate space, there's always the productivity trap where the more you do, the more is expected of you and it kind of just never goes away as well. So being in this position that I am in right now, it has given space for me to kind of prove myself because now the people that my manager, so most of the time, because I I am just the analyst in my working space, most of the time my manager would be the one who'd have those in-depth discussions with the executives or the people in the C-suite. And now I'm the one who has to step up and have those discussions which means that it's a lot more pressure. And because I'm interacting with them for the first time, the pressure is to kind of 
act and be a certain way and be at a certain standard, even though that isn't necessarily the position that I'm currently holding right now, which is a lot because I actually had had this conversation with my manager before he left for his now position. And I genuinely told him that I wasn't ready and I wanted to be in that position when I feel like I've gotten enough training for it or I have enough capacity for it because I've only joined the team a few months ago, 10 months ago now. And I find that some of the expectations are just too much and maybe the part that I should be playing would be to communicate. But sometimes when it comes to corporate, unfortunately, there's no balance. Even if you do communicate those boundaries that you have for yourself, it's always just hard because of that feeling that you need to prove yourself. You need to prove that you can do so much and you have this and you have this capacity and you can achieve this much. Mm. So, I mean, it sounds like one of the things that would be quite helpful for you is on the one level, because what I'm hearing from you is that there's two levels. There's a personal level of pressure. There's also just the, the work level of I have to prove myself. There's this kind of organization and this environment that I'm working in. So it sounds like on the personal level, you have to kind of establish what will it look like when I've achieved, when I've done enough and when I've actually completed what I need to do for my role, for my work at, you know, at work or my environment? What are the measurable goals? What are the measurements that I can set for myself to say, okay, fine, I've done these five things this week. I actually have done enough. I don't have to constantly ask myself, are you doing enough? And I think on the work front or the organizational level, it's about having to establish those boundaries of saying to the people you're working with or your manager, what do you need from me this week? What are the deliverables that we need to achieve? And then you work towards that. And is that even feasible, right? Because I generally find that burnout is fueled and perpetuated by these expectations that you have of yourself, but also your team or your manager has of you, but nobody communicates those expectations. And therefore, it always feels like you're missing the mark. So when those expectations are not clear and explicit, it really feels like, but I feel like I'm drowning and I don't know what to do. So how do I actually get myself in a space where I feel like I've at least achieved the things that I want to achieve? So it seems like you may have to, in that journaling front that we started speaking on, I think you may have to start adding another layer of saying, what are my expectations of myself, but also engaging with your team and your manager to say, what are your expectations of me this particular month or this week, so that you know when you've met those deliverables that actually I am doing something. Because generally in the workplace, you only do like your performance reviews once a quarter. And by then it's a, you have not achieved or you missed somewhere, but it didn't catch you as things were going. And that daily anxiety, because I mean, it's a daily anxiety to feel like I'm not doing enough. I'm not achieving enough. And like you're saying, you have been thrown kind of bit in a deep end with a new role. And it doesn't seem like there was a necessary handover to start speaking to the people that you're speaking to. Absolutely. I mean, I think there's a lot of layers to it, Lonela, to be honest with you. The fact that there's no clarity in terms of expectations from either side. And even if there is, for someone who's afraid of conflict as I am, right, which is probably the root cause of all of this, because I'm afraid of going to a place where I'm saying that, listen, I'll go there if it's the last resort, if that even makes sense. So if it's during month end and we're working on a lot of stuff, sometimes we'll probably have to work for 24 hours, right? Which is not even legal, to be honest. And then in that case, that's when I'll be like, no, I'm knocking off. I can't do this anymore. And I'm done, you know, but that that will be when, um, you know, I've been pushed to that point. And I guess, you know, you're right that I kind of need to set those expectations for myself to say that if I have done these many things within this week, then for me, that is enough. And sometimes you do do that. I actually made a commitment to myself that I wanted to have this power hour to myself before I start my day. I want to commit to it. You know, it's very important to me. But then I find that I have 
so many things to do that day that I have to complete within that day that I'll wake up maybe at four o'clock. And usually what I'll do is that maybe I'll wake up at four and then I'll have my power off hour between four and five. And then that works out. But then there's something that I need to do maybe around that time, because that's when I have my maximum concentration. Then I'll substitute my power hour to basically do that. And then in the process, I kind of become resentful even towards my job because I feel that it's taking so much away from me. And if I'm being honest, I haven't received good feedback on how much I've stepped up into the role and how well I'm doing and all of those things. But I think I perhaps need to establish within myself if I have reasonable expectations of myself in the first place. Because when a lot of people are telling you that you're doing well, there's kind of also that pressure that, okay, can I keep this up? I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. You're mentioning such important things, Asive, because firstly, I absolutely love the power hour. And I think as much as possible, don't compromise that because I think that's you filling your own cup. And generally, if you don't protect that space for yourself, you find that the resentment that you're speaking about comes out. Then drag, right, to do things. So Mm. even if you want to do something in that time and you're thinking this is my most, you know, kind of like ultimate concentration moment, I think don't compromise on it, stick to it because I really think it's, it's, it's you giving a hug to yourself. Exactly. One of the other things that's important in what you're mentioning is that the relationship with yourself is so important in existing in an environment, especially in an environment that's quite demanding, right? So there's having to negotiate between this is my work and this is what I need to do at work. I need to achieve. People are looking at me. I'm being praised, which means I have to keep up with the standard that I've already started achieving and also realizing that actually adjusting or at least some level of balance in your life means that at some points you are not always performing in your ultimate kind of space. So you have to scale. So I don't believe in work-life balance. I don't think that's a thing that's doable. Why you don't believe in the work-life balance? Because, you know, it's something that so many people speak about that it's possible to have that work-life balance. Well, I don't think it is. And I think I've also seen it from my work as a therapist that it's not always possible because when people speak about work-life balance, they speak about it as if everything kind of functions properly at all your different levels, your spirituality, your work, your home, everything, all at the same time, simultaneously, it all works very well. I think it's very hard to achieve that equilibrium. But what I do believe in is that at some point in your life, you're going to maybe have 60% functioning at work and 40% in your personal life. And I think it's important to evaluate in your life to say, what do I need the most now? Do I need to focus more on my social life because I've been feeling really down and I've been feeling like I actually need to point to my own cup? Or do I need to really focus on work because these things are out of the way? If you have that balance in your mind or at least that scaling in your mind that says, I want to prioritize these particular things at these particular times, you are Mm. able to have a little bit of some balance. I'm saying that in inverted commas, because what we trap ourselves with is that we think we can be absolutely working well and functioning efficiently in all areas of our lives all at the same Mm. time. And that's generally Mm. the biggest trap because then you keep feeling like I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. I'm not reaching this level of, you know, this equilibrium and everything is really just working well. But if you actually start thinking about, yes, at some level of my life, my work is going to absolutely thrive. Mm. And at some levels of my life, my personal life is absolutely going to thrive as long as I never drop the ball and I kind of understand where do I need to lose a little bit of of strength and when can I you know kind of like pull up a little bit in other areas of of your life I feel like that's more manageable it's not a trap of saying 
I have to keep doing, doing, doing. Because I also find that some people in the idea of doing self-care will do really like, you know, they're tired. I'm still going to, you know, drive to a spa and they really just want to sleep. <laughs> so sometimes you kind of mm. have to like a balance to say, what do I need rather than what is ideal, either conceptually or what would look good as a self-care routine. But what do I actually need? Maybe what you need in that moment is to sleep. Maybe you don't actually need to listen to a powerful podcast or whatever you just need to rest and then after resting you can listen to the powerful podcast you don't have to force yourself to do what seems necessary or what conceptually feels like this is the best self-care thing sure sure yeah no <laughs> that hit home that hit home because i think for me i like i'm i'm always always trying to optimize stuff like I'm trying to figure out how can I optimize this so that I have the best outcome out of it instead of what do I actually need in this moment so that that hit home for sure Mm -hmm. I think that I needed to hear that I needed to hear that We did touch a little bit on this earlier in terms of how I can prioritize my power hour in the morning. But what kind of steps do you think that I can take to ensure that I protect it? Maybe like in terms of what steps do I need to take to a point where I kind of know that this is something that's important to me. And I know that you conceptually you can't tell me that you need to be able to prioritize this but are there any kind of steps that I can take just to ensure for myself that I kind of prioritize that hour so I think it it always goes back I think I think for me it goes back into understanding first um before we try to solve is to what, mm. you, I mean, your power hour is very early. Uh, it's at four o'clock in the morning, which means it's already a sacrifice. <laughs> it's already a sacrifice of sleep to have that. Um, so what generally yes. makes you feel like, oh no, I actually need to use this very early hour for something else? I don't know if this plays any role to it because that for me, the power hour is also just to help me in my writing as well. So... I'm not sure then, you know, if you when you're mentioning the fact that I kind of have to sacrifice my sleep in order to get it done, if it's still a part of that efficiency trap that I put myself in, where I'm saying that if I wake up at four o'clock, then, you know, I'll have this power hour and, and it still contributes to the fact I'll have a little bit of time to just write something because obviously this is like a one of the dreams that I have for myself and still be able to to wake up and have enough hours to actually do my job my daytime job so I'm not sure now because I think then it's a matter of my intention in the first place Mm. for the power hour yeah Mm. so so I mean I think to what you're saying what I would say is that then you need to schedule your writing time and you know your power hours outside of the power hour outside of that because I think what the power hour from my understanding what you're trying to intend with that is is get a sense of grounding Mm. and a sense of calm before the day starts which is you know hearing yourself think some level of meditation but it's really about you gathering your thoughts and your understanding of where am I and how do I kind of start this day? And your writing is more mm. of an achievement or a, a, a task or an activity that requires a different level of, I guess, rhythm because that requires you to write. It's something that you absolutely love and it pours into your cup, which I think is where sometimes the lines get blurry is that you may feel very fulfilled at the end of writing, but it doesn't mean that it gives you the rest that you need. Sure. You know, so the thing about rest is that there's rest that's more passive, which is, you know, sleep, take a nap, um, sit and all of that. But there's also a little bit of active rest and active rest is about how do I actually bring that sense of calm and peace into my mind? And what we generally mm. do as people is that we, we do very well with a passive kind of rest, which is lying down and sleeping and or just kind of like having a glass of wine or something. But just the I'm not doing anything kind of rest. But the active rest is about saying, how do I really clear my mind and declutter 
all the things that are happening in my mind so that I can feel like I am aware of my environment and I understand what's going on and I can actually write very well and all of that. It's a conscious kind of rest of saying, I want to have a, a moment of peace. I want to ground myself. And I think that's the intention of your power hour. If, if that's what I'm understanding mm. from you, it's an active kind of rest. Mm. It's not the sleep um, that gives you, you know, like your rest and feeling like, okay, fine, I can go through the day. So I think if you can schedule the things that you need to do, of course, once in a while, you'll miss it, you know, around month end kind of reviews or deadlines or year yeah. end stuff. But generally what you then get into is the rhythm of saying, I don't compromise this time because when I don't have it, I know that level of anxiety that then comes on me and then I'm even less productive mm. than if I just use that hour to be productive right so it's having to understand that's mm. why I prioritize it because I know it fills up my cup way more than it actually helps me be productive in doing something in that particular time Right, right. So um, that is that is such an important point, and I do want to get into what constitutes um, active rest, right? But one of the things that I've actually started implementing mm-hmm. since our last conversation is that just in the topic of having active rest, I've started going on hikes alone. I think I did mention in our previous conversation that I'm actually an Enneagram Type Five, which is the Quiet Specialist. So I am introverted even though it doesn't seem that way, (laughs) even though it doesn't seem that way. So in order to, to kind of even have that, what is this, um, inner child work, I've started going on hikes alone, right? I mean, obviously like in spaces where it's safe to do so. And I know that for sure that it's probably going to be like five kilometers, even though I did challenge myself last time and I did like 13. But um, I think that's one of the things that I have now started to implement because I'm sitting down most of the week and, you know, I'm constantly on my chair and there isn't really like something that's active where I can be like, you know, I'm taking my body out on just having that body rest from sitting or lying down, which is what I'm doing most of the week. So I've started implementing changes like that where I kind of go on a walk or I go on a hike and I just contemplate and think about everything and nothing at the same time. So I have implemented that. But what do you think then constitutes a fueling power hour? Is it just journaling in general? Is it me doing my personal development work? Or, you know, if I'm seeing a psychologist, is it the is it the homework that I will usually get from the psychologist? Is it prayer? What constitutes having that fueling power hour? I think it really differs from different people in terms of what does that. But I think from just this conversation that we had, as if it were we start is the day before. So in order Mm. to prepare for your power hour, I'd say start from the day before, because I think just from the conversation that we've had the last time in this one, what would help is having to do a to-do list for the next day, finding out what does my next day look like and what do I want to achieve in that particular day. And the reason why I'm saying that is that you have your power hour at four o'clock, but I think sometimes it probably gets overtaken by the anxiety of what you still need to do. So when you've kind of planned your day the day before, you can sleep peacefully because you don't have to keep thinking, oh, I need to remember to do A, B, C, D, because you know there's a reference where you can find it um, the next day when you actually need to say, okay, what am I doing today? What it also helps with is that now at four o'clock, when you're doing your power hour, you're not taking the time off to say, yes, I'm trying to relax and I'm trying to calm down and ground myself, but also what do I need to do? Or did I forget anything the day before? Because that anxiety of having to figure out what do I need to do for this coming day is probably what takes away the peace from the power hour itself. So then when you've kind of done Mm. that prep work, then you can utilize your power hour by planning for it. What do you want to do? So maybe what you want to do on one day is just ground yourself and really just think about, you know, reflecting on your career and the kinds of things that you still want to achieve from it or or really just meditate. And then at the end of it, you're thinking to yourself, what would I have liked 
to also do and maybe then that becomes your plan for the power hour for the next day right so it feels mm-hmm. like some level of because i know you are quite a, an achiever based kind of person so at the end of something you want to you kind of want to feel like okay there's something that was achieved in this moment and there's something that i'm actually working towards because then i think that's going to help you feel like i have some level of control and some level of direction as to what i'm doing even in my resting phases I'm still quite intentional about that because if you sit and you don't kind of have some level of a plan of what to do in that hour then it can feel quite anxiety provoking and then the question of am I utilizing this hour effectively mm. then comes in because you're like oh maybe I shouldn't maybe I should do this but maybe I should do this but if there's some level of plan of what you really want to do in Maybe you plan for the 30 minutes and you don't for the other 30 minutes, but really some level of guidance into what you want to do. I think you'll achieve quite a lot. In your- yeah. So you're basically saying, I think you are alluding to the fact that if I have a solid plan, obviously like achievable goals, like a, a plan that is tangible almost, then I can be able to to have that feeling of, okay, cool, I can scratch this off my list almost. Yeah. Even with my power hour, I can say that next time when I'm doing it, you know, this is what I want to add or this is, wanna, uh, this is what I want to take away just as a measure for myself, I guess, that I've done enough. Mm. Because even though I am, you know, essentially an achiever, or someone who likes the feeling of having achieved, I am always anxious about making plans or creating goals for myself, which is probably the reason why I've gotten myself into this trap in the first place, because because I'm so afraid of failure in general, I usually avoid making plans or creating goals for myself because I feel like maybe I'm being hard on myself in that way and being dismissive of myself when I do that because then I don't plan and I'll be like, I'll just see myself when I do it because then I don't want to have that feeling of having disappointed myself. Yeah, and that's a really hard one, hey, Um, because that's harsh because, one, you, you kind of want, your heart wants stuff, right? Your heart wants to achieve things. Your heart wants to plan things. But then there's a level of saying, mm. you know what, if I do plan it, what happens if it doesn't work out? Mm. But also at the same time, I think you've proven to yourself, and, I, and this is where self-reflection is so important, is that you've kind of proven to yourself that you can actually achieve quite a lot. And in the conversation we had, you know, our first conversation, you went a little bit into your background on in terms of just, you know, growing up Elsigi Sigi and and having to kind of feel like I need to study, I need to work hard for me to get to the places where I want to get to, right? And and you've Mm. done that. You, You achieved that. You set a goal in your life and you achieve that. Here's the thing about our lives, right? When we're growing up, we have this set trajectory of our lives that kind of gets planned up by society. When you're in primary, you have to get to high school. When you're in high school, you have to get to varsity. When you're in varsity, you kind of have to work. When you work, maybe you want to buy yourself a car and buy yourself a home, right? So there's this trajectory mm. that's really set out that, that you know, no, you, you don't think about it much. That's the goal. So it doesn't feel like a goal that you're setting that you can then disappoint point yourself from but when you've kind of achieved all of the kind of set things comes the decisions and the decisions become the things that you now do because you want them so this is where you now put your heart on the slab right and saying I actually want to see myself become a partner Mm. I want to do this I want to register for this I want to I want to do this so now it's your heart it's not survival um, it's not subsistence. It's not sure. making sure that you're financially okay for your grandmother, for your family. It's it's not about that because that level has been achieved. Now it's about self-actualization. It's about, am I happy? What do I want to do with my life? Is this fulfilling me in any way? And I think that's where we struggle. We struggle there because now there are so many decisions that we can actually make. But you then ultimately have to choose your heart. Oh, it's hard, eh? It's hard because you're like, but what if I yeah. disappoint myself? Like, <laughs> I'm not happy. But what if you are happy? Like, 
get out of my head get out of my head i can't take this anymore <laughs> i can't take this anymore so um you know what lonele you of course you you have an understanding of my background and where i come from and you probably have an intrinsic understanding of what it's taken for me to get here as well which is why you're saying all the things that you're saying but i think like you hit the nail on the head there before i took a bath this morning i was thinking when we were in school every year we had a report back to us that would tell us that this year this is how you have done and even the exams they would kind of give you something to push towards mm-hmm. and now when you try to get out from your place of survival and you're trying to get to a place of self actualization as you were saying that is hard because you have to make all these decisions and to be quite honest with you thinking back i've always tried to take the safest decision like the decision that would still leave me with a lot of options right that's me mm-hmm. so um even in high school just thinking back i took i took science subjects because if you did science subjects then you could be anything afterwards right mm. and even when i went to varsity i went and i studied applied maths because i still have a plethora of options post studying that as well and now it seems as if my running away from making decisions has run out right that grace period has run out and now i have to make those decisions i have to say that okay this is my own curriculum Mm. and i have to kind of set that trajectory for myself now because like how you were saying before it was imposed on by society it was imposed on by my parents and a lot of it also i kind of attached my identity to it as well right because mm. if i'm if i'm doing well in this then everything is all well, everything is fine and now I kind of have to step out of that and and try and figure it out on my own and it's so frustrating. <laughs> it's so 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 frustrating because now I have to make decisions. Now I have to leave with the fact that if I've made the wrong decision, then what happens? Then that's when the fear comes in that I could make this decision and then what happens with my life or I could throw this away. Because I think that another thing with burnout as well is that you you kind of for me anyway it's it's that you kind of feel you're there but you're detached as well mm. right mm. because in your mind i would rather be doing something else right mm. and that's where the self actualization comes because a part of it is also that because i know that you know my whole heart was in it then i could do this and i could do this and i could do this but i'd rather be doing something else and so that also kind of makes me resentful and to not even be present to be present to realize and to recognize my contributions mm. to the space that i find myself in because i'm stuck and i'm detached not just from my job but also from who i am in this moment mm. right mm. and i'm just trying to reach to to the future level of me where i'm not even there already because i'm trying to make sure is it safe for me to go there in the first yeah. place yeah. so i think that you know the the whole idea of self actualization post you having achieved in inverted commas the all that was required of you to achieve as per your society is where the fear comes in because now you know you have to be 100% responsible for you mm yeah i mean i think that's so true asive because there's a level of performance that gives you the assurance in the other things mm. so when you are at school when you get a report card there's something that kind of says to you you're doing well keep going keep pushing mm. but when you do things for yourself there really isn't that level of measure it, it's not it's not like that it's not li- a linear measure it's not a a matrix set by someone it really is something where you feel 
I feel happy. And I think that's where sometimes it gets really tricky because happiness is not measurable. You just feel content. And what fuels burnout is that our self-esteem becomes very performance-based. So sure. we are like, oh, I'm, I'm performing like this. Then that means I'm doing great. And then you kind of keep pushing. Oh, this is how bad I'm performing. That means I'm not doing very great. And then when that kind of I'm not doing well strike kind of, you know, hits, you then keep going down. Oh, even this, I'm not doing very well. And even this, I'm not doing well. And of course, you're not going to do well because your mind doesn't have the capacity to actually achieve anything because, you know, it keeps feeling attacked by the criticism mm. of I'm not doing well, I'm not doing well, this is not doing great. So that's where sometimes we find that our burnout is fueled by that performance thing. But I think you know this at work, your you know, your manager can say, well done, but generally the performance measure isn't as well as it is at school. It isn't as well as it is at varsity, where you literally see for this particular module, this is how well I'm doing. So in the work environment, sometimes all you have is, oh, thank you. Oh, cool. Fine. Um, so you have yeah. to internalize that, right? Because if you don't internalize it, you're going to continuously keep working because you're trying to get the same level of validation of you're doing well in here, you're doing well in here, and it won't come because the more you work at, you know, in a, in, in a working environment, the more it's an expectation. So when you start working 12 hours and you're achieving more than other people, then it becomes expected that as if it actually achieves like this. So when you don't below that, it's no longer a you've gone beyond your call of duty. It's a your performance has mm-hmm. dropped, right? And then mm-hmm. you have to keep on that you have to keep doing 12 hour kind of shifts and working because now anything below that is no longer what you are expected to do even though you had done that in seeking that validation of your manager or your team saying well done you've performed very well so that's why it's, it's so important for it to be internalized for you to know okay what does it mean when i am doing very well what does it mean when things are going well in my kind of environment but you know it 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 really starts with you asking a lot of questions of why am I doing this you know why am I waking Mm. up early and Mm. taking my time and kind of doing other things about it and generally there's a response to it that may not be very nice to hear from yourself Mm. yeah of course of course Sure. I've learned so much, you know, from just this discussion. I think getting to a point of just self-actualizing and and defining, you know, what my success is for myself. And even the point where, because you have been performing at this level, that when you're no longer performing at that level, now it feels like you've basically dropped the ball, Mm. even though you haven't really. You know, that is very, very insightful. Something that I am definitely going to ponder on and really asking myself the whys, the whys. Because when we're growing up, don't ask a lot of questions, just do it because it's the right thing to do. Mm. Um, Yeah. yeah. I mean, thank you. Thank you, Asiva, for this conversation and even for being vulnerable because these are honestly the things that we should be talking about these are the things that most people are going through but it's just the if I start acknowledging it then what does that mean you know if I start acknowledging Mm -hmm. that sometimes this is how I feel in the working environment what does that say about me am I not as dedicated am I not this am I not that which is really not true because we all drive ourselves in that space where we are burnt out when we constantly feel like we need to be achieving stuff, we need to be proving ourselves, we need to be validating and affirming a lot of things. Mm. So I think for me, you know, you, you, you're you doing very well in terms of just being so self-aware. I think that's such an important thing. And it starts there. It starts at being self-aware. It starts at having to sometimes tell yourself, you know what, I need to stop. I need to pause. I need to do this. And I think one of the things you really have to kind of help yourself through is having to trust that you're doing well, you know, you're doing enough and you don't have to prove yourself in those kinds of ways. Because if you've met 
the things that you and your manager, the things that you and yourself kind of decide on, that means you actually have performed quite well. And even the extra things, mm-hmm. then that means you've, exp- you know, performed even better than what you expected to. So that you can go to your manager and say, listen, I think we probably need another person because these are the things that I'm doing and, and I need help in this kind of regard. So when you have some level of tangible things that you've written down, that you've journaled, the tasks that you've done, it kind of helps in making the case and it doesn't feel confrontational right when you talk to your manager Mm. or your team that actually this is not working i can't you know keep up with these things because these are the things i can actually keep up with on a a weekly basis so it really is just having to to assert yourself but also just you know protect yourself in the ways that you know in your environment in your work environment they're not going to protect you so that they can learn because sometimes we have to give them the template to this is how you treat me so that they can learn that actually I don't call Asive on a Sunday asking for things. You know, she's either not going to respond or she's going to email on a Monday and saying, I received your missed call. Can I help you with something? You know, having to mm. those boundaries in place. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lonile. And thank you for the platform for me to share you know, my story and to share the stuff that makes us, you know, vulnerable to a lot of things thank you thank you so much i'm grateful for the platform to be able to share my story thank you Asive. i hope that like Asive, you now have some points to ponder about your working life and that you feel inspired to make some changes for your own mental health you've been listening to clinical psychologist luanele kasu sharing her insights into how we can deal with burnout. We're excited to bring you more psychological insights in a therapeutic setting that can help you, especially as young working professionals, nurture your mental health. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a thing. You can also connect with us on the thespacebetweenus.africa. This was the podcast for courageous young professionals, brought to you by Africa's online mental health platform, The Space Between Us. Thank you.